mentioned before, for technical reasons, the videos can have a certain length, um, each individual video. So, um, the, the bearers of culture will be the ones who also define culture, and who define it as common, as part of a common identity. And again, it helped that they had a common uh, you know, enemy, who was not necessarily the Habsburgs, but were the Germanization, those, it was the German-minded in the Austrian Empire. The part of the Austrian Empire, whether Austrians or Germans, not the same, who pushed towards Austria becoming part of this new German project. There was a strong push even within the Austrian Empire to make Austria just another state within the, what was building up to become the German, one German state. And that would have been absurd because unlike these Germanic states here, which were all Germanic and mostly Germanic, except for Prussia, which had a good chunk of Polish, Austria was essentially multinational, multi ethnic, multi religious. Austrians formed just a tiny bit here. A huge part was Hungary, <laughs> which controlled Cro Cro historical Croatia and the Slovaks and Romanians and Transylvania, which had other nationalities. So the Austrian project has always, the Habsburg project has always been in nature different than a national project. You know. So in the end, when Germany will form, Austria will, will be separated. They will be actually enemies. They will fight with each other. Uh, and, and Austria will be defeated, not one Germany. Okay, so these were a few things about Czech again, just to give you some, some connections, because you know you have the chapters and uh, on Canvas, I also specified in the documents posted to the, uh, today the pages in each of these chapters which refer specifically to the cultural aspect. These are in addition to the pages I indicated, uh, meaning different from the pages I indicated uh, in the weekly work plan, which only deals with, deal with politics. But to to, if you want to understand and to understand the cultural dimension, there are, for each of these countries, there are about two pages or so, uh, where, where in these chapters, uh, the, the authors talk about just the cultural part. Okay, so hunger. Well, here's a, here's a difficult beast, isn't it? Because what you have, by the way, at this point, it's not yet austria hunger this is the uh, uh, wrong, it's actually just the Austrian Empire. Uh, the Hamburg Empire, this is 1815, if I recall correctly. Right? But Hungary, right, the historical Hungary had become part of the Habsburg Empire, and we discussed the fact that uh, the nobles and the people have revolted so often and so violently that the Habsburg just treated the Hungarians differently. No, no, you have your own diet, you do your thing, I'm going to be the king of you separately from being the king of Austria, it's fine, <laughs> and I, I'm not going to change your laws. And we talked about the fact that this had the negative effect of keeping, you know, the relations feudal, of uh, not encouraging the, uh, these re enlightenment reforms. On the other hand, they had a measure of self-governance that other lands did not have, just like the Czechs. And they were not subject to, although they were attempted to do forced Germanization, but in their case it failed miserably because, because of all these institutional barriers. Unlike in the Czech lands where it was imposed to, to a degree. But remember what Hungary was throughout the history that we have imagined. Hungary as a state. It has always been, right again, a nation of nobles. Right? Uh, nobles who were of various ethnic origins, but again, didn't matter. That wasn't an issue. It wasn't, it, uh, it's like today, does it matter when you vote for someone what ethnic origin they have in America? Right? No. It's, it's similar. Because your identity is politically defined just like the nobles' identity was as well. This is why the medieval Polish uh, even Czech and Hungarian states are closer to the modern American state than the modern Hungarian, Polish, and Czech states, which are ethnically defined. So then, if you are a member of the political body, you are a member of the nation, just like in America. I am a citizen, I do have a passport, you are American. It doesn't matter what language you spoke at home. Although you are kind of made to speak English, right, in order to function, as we discussed. Uh, in, in administration and, and so on, you can't win elections by not speaking English. Um, so, you have had these, this, this history of, of uh, um, self-rule and attempts to impose some, Germ you know, Germanization, but, you know, much 
more unsuccessful and, and in fact inefficient than in the case of the of the of the check check methods. But remember the other thing: this is a time of the emergence of cultural national identities. Like this was the trend in the 19th century. 19th century, the, the, we started thinking of the world as it's made of different nations. All of them speak a different language. I mentioned this. You know, I call it. Uh, usually the, the Lord of the Rings view of international uh, politics. There's the orcs, there's the elves, who each live in their own little... Uh, these live in the caves, these live in the forest, they all look different. They, some are blonde, some are small. Small and dark, tall and blonde. That, that's, and the whole world is made of these little groups of different things, who have different little different uh, habits and the different songs and the different little cute ways of doing things and cuisine and whatever. Like the world is neatly organizing these neatly delineated things, false, 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 false. And they all have their own government separate, right? This is all, uh, you know, which is not the, the case. But the 19th century is when this becomes a narrative. And, 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 and the idea of, of freedom and the whole idea of freedom and people who should, be, who should rule themselves, uh, you know, just fuels this. Because the whole trend of the, of the time becomes people freeing themselves. From age-old oppression. What age-old oppression? You were just told that you were oppressed ages ago. You didn't realize back then. Because back then, if you were noble, you were not oppressed. If you were a peasant, maybe you were. That's about it. I don't care what language you spoke at home. Right? But that becomes a narrative. Because of the idea of democratization, individual rights, and whatever. So, so in Hungary, you will have both of these happening at the same time. One, a strong tradition of statehood based on the citizenship of the nobility, basically, the, the nation of nobles, which was politically defined nationhood. And the new one, because they find themselves in the Austrian Empire, which is, you know, Germanic still, I mean, you know, uh, well, Austrian, let's not put it this way, so not Hungarian. <laughs> so you have this cultural difference. So you also have the cultural nationalism rising. And these happen at the same time. And the two key figures in Hungarian history so sort of remains even later is Seychelles and Kossuth. I think there's a Kossuth County in, in Washington or something. Uh, not for not because he immigrated to America. Uh, so Seychelles and Kossuth, and each of them, this one is representative of the political nationalism uh, and Kossuth of sort of the ethno cultural nationalism, unfortunately. Because us, the Hungarian, well, these people who suddenly find themselves clearly more clearly as Hungarians as, uh, needed to be dis distinct from the Austrian rule, pride, and the history of uh, state or whatever. Uh, you know, and there are two, two ways here. In a society that was deeply divided between very rich nobles, a few, a mass of petty nobles who weren't that rich, some rising bourgeoisie, but not too much, and many peasants. So, you know, still agricultural, mostly. Not very improved uh, economically and so on, and very fractured. And politically, only the ones who the only ones who mattered were the nobles and the middle class. Basically, were starting to matter, but it was mostly the very high nobles and the middle nobles. And actually, Seychelles came from a high noble family, and Kosho came from a sort of a lower uh, noble family, petty noble. Right? But they they represent two different directions. Seychelles, his idea was that. Progress itself, meaning industrial, uh, economic, technological, uh, transportation progress. This is why I posted an image of the famous bridge of chains, chains, lands in, in Budapest, uh, which is still standing when you go visit, and really beautiful, which was one of his works of Seychelles because he envisioned the, the, the progress and the integration of the Hungarian state through improve, general improvement of the life of everyone. Legal, economic, technological, social, as a community, whatever. And he said, then everybody will, will, be, will want to be part of this modern nation. Koshut took the ethno-cultural. Oh, and so that bridge was designed, and actually it was a product of, of Seiji, it's still standing. And it was key because it, it linked the two parts of Budapest, which is Buddha and Pest, into one, hence Budapest, uh, over the day. Koshut, however, was a more of a... Unfortunately, for Koshut, you know, from my perspective, for example, if I, if I would take a side, uh, Koshut was a fiery orator, a fiery speaker. He had huge charisma. He was... They, by the way, they both respected each other, you know, honestly. 
but they were on different views. Korshut took the ethnocultural view. And he, here's the irony. He was on the side that we need to have a Hungarian and Hungarian-speaking state. Well, and now let's remember this is what Hungary was. If we took it ethnically, which didn't matter before, but if we would take it ethnically, here was the ethnic composition of the Hungarian kingdom. Still, of, of Hungarian state, even within Austria. Well, uh, look, these, the brown ones, would be Hungarians. How do you create a state of the Hungarians here? So his policy was forced Magyarization. Making Hungarians, you know, by making it the compulsory language in administration, in school, and so on. Exactly what the Habsburgs tried to do, did on the Czech lands and tried to do with the Hungarians, Hungarians turned around and did on the other ethnic groups. Well, guess how they react? This just fueled their own ethnic nationalism. And the conflicts this has generated, and this idea of sort of imposing and a sort of a looking down, has created traumas that are even today shaped the relationship between these peoples. Today there is a Slovakia and there is a Hungary, and they don't have, the, 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 the states do not have. Well, the best of relations. There is a Romania, there is a Hungary. Romanians were inventing again and discovering and writing their identity and history at the same time. But uh, today the states do not, well, they have peaceful relations, but the people, uh, culturally, there's this thing. Which comes from, from here and from a specific reading of history that was just reinforced at this time. And yes, these Romanians in the Transylvania, because this is Transylvania. When they, they start narrating their uh, a common identity, just based on language, because there was never a Romanian, you know, so Romania, right, before that. Against whom do they define their identity? Well, against the ruling Hungarian class. Against whom do Slovaks define their identity? Slovaks who never had a state in their history, and who have always been part of the Hungarian state, against, at this point, the, this Hungarian pressure. But again, it has to do, arguably, with the policy, with, with the direction of, of, of defining. So, uh, the one, so the Hungarians are fighting for self-determination against the Austrians, but not granting the self, same self-determination to these other ethnic groups and kind of incorporating them in the... It's this idea that, well, you, they would surely want to be Hungarian. But it's the same thing that the French did in history. Surely everybody else in French and the same that, you know, the United States uh, consciousness, national consciousness is that, well, think of the Declaration of Independence, right? We want to be free because everybody, you know, we're created equal, but those under us seemingly are not, don't have the same rights. There's always this dynamic. You know, always someone is... You know, very often, someone who is a victim in one circumstance simultaneously is also the oppressor in another circumstance. Because you always say, well, why don't, why wouldn't they want to be us? Right? Everybody wants to be Hungarian. Everybody wants to be French. Everybody wants to be American. Right? Well, seemingly not everyone. Think of Lincoln and the South, besides the issue of state. Well, the same, Lincoln was a nationalistic leader. And he defined the nation as something that has to stay together. Why? Set a, a part of the population again, putting the slavery issue uh, and, uh, you know, uh, aside. It was a, a dynamic of nation and state building, in which one, so one part did not want to be part of the state, and it was forced to stay inside. What I'm pointing out is that this, this, this process has happened throughout the world. At around the same time, remember, we're talking 18... 1850s, it's the same time that all of this takes place. The birth of the modern state and the modern nation, it's all a process around the world. And in certain parts it will go on up to the middle of the 20th century, when India will have to define itself again as a nation, which it never was in history. It's an invention, not even, even today. It speaks hundreds of dialects and religions and tribal identities. And what's India then? Or in Africa, with decolonialization after World War II. Or in Yugoslavia, in the wars in the 1990s. It's still part of the same process. In 1990s, 150 years later, there are wars fought for self-determination. Based on the principle that there is a nation, each nation needs to have its state. And who is this nation, who is that nation? Well, why can't we just get along? Well, exactly, why shouldn't the United States be part of Canada? You see? 
just see the conundrum. See the conundrum. That it's easy to project this to do others, but not onto me. Right? Um, and we have today, you know, the attempts by Scotland had a referendum last year. In which it voted, or, or earlier this year, uh, last year, in which it voted for independence from Britain. From Britain, from the United Kingdom. Catalonia, part of Spain, had an unrecognized referendum to declare independence from Spain. It's still going on. It still is going on. The United Kingdom might fall apart. So, so these are the two, the two tracks we're talking about. And the Caution Twins, because that was the time, that was the moment. He spoke the language of the moment, he was also more charismatic. And in fact, when he becomes the leader of the famous, in 1848, which is something back with the Springtime of Nations, the Hungarians grasp the moment to declare their self-rule, and when push came to, come to shove, even independence from the Habsburg uh, uh, Empire. And the Habsburgs were under attack by many earlier people, many other places in the empire, so they couldn't fight back, so actually they win for a while. They, meaning these Hungarians, the Hungarian parliament, you know, declares this. But guess how they lose? They lose on two fronts. The Croatians, who, remember, they had their own system of government within the Hungarian state, which was within the Habsburg state, three levels, and who have been historically allied with the Hungarian Northwest, even against the Habsburgs, at the middle of the 19th century they turned against the Hungarians. And actually half the Habsburgs crushed down the Hungarian rule, maybe perhaps on the fact that they were afraid of this pressure to make, make modernize, to Hungarianize them. And that's, so, the Hungarians are attacked from the south, the, the Habsburg army from here, and guess what, the Tsar of Russia, who was a cousin of the Emperor of Austria, sends his troops, and by that time, the Hungarians are, are crushed. And uh, one key moment here was the execution of the 13 generals of the Hungarian army, 1848-49, which happened on October 6th. Which happened on October 6th, and still celebrated, well, commemorated every year. And what's interesting about these 13 generals were executed by, uh, by, by the Austrians, so to speak, but uh, you know, when the Russians and the Austrians together crushed the Hungarian and defeated them. By the way, executed in the, next to the town of Arad, uh, which is in today's Romania, i.e. Transylvania. So somewhere here. What's, 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 and, and you know, there are the quotes of the 13 generals, uh, which if I find I will post. But what's interesting is that these generals were of various nationalities and they fought for the independence of Hungary, but against the ethnic minorities. And there were some of them Austrians, some German. Were, one of the important generals was General Bang, who was Polish. Actually, few of them were ethnic Hungarians and they fought for the independence of Hungary. It just gives you a sense of how these things, how the liberal national program. Freedom for the people, or which people, these people, were what, why not those people? How complex it was. And all these constituents are patriots and, and actually very religious men, and, and so on and so on, and fought for a noble cause, the independence of Hungary, and, and failed. This is also the, 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 the 1848 revolution, is when the national poet of Hungary, uh, Patrick who uh, is killed um, in one of the battles, he was 26. He was the one who wrote the famous national song which I linked, which was recited at the beginning of the revolution in Budapest in, in 1848. Again, um, an example of a writer who is both a poet, a language modernizer, and a nationalistic leader. Which is common for all these all these lands. You will have writers who will be both writers and political organizers, and nationalistic leaders, and language modernizers. They define who will define both both define history and shape the language through their writing, and be part of the political actions to 
for independence and national freedom and whatever other stuff. And some of them will die in this process, like Pantheon Philippe. He was 26. And this is why they're called national poets, national writer, which is a weird name, which is, you know, in the, like, you know, uh, for example, for us here, national, what is a national poet? Like, do we pay for him or what? But you don't understand that now the why they are considered national poets, because they wrote at the time and about and contributed to shaping the formation of the given nationhood. The defined definition of the given nation. Nation building. They were part of the process of nation building and shaped that. And here's the other irony, because ethnically actually Petrofi was from a half Slavic origin. <laughs> and he's the national poet and he was the fierce Hungarian. Franz Liszt, famous composer, Hungarian composer. Right? Uh, acting a little bit later, but uh, around the same. Uh, right? Writes Hungarian Rhapsody, Hungarian this, Hungarian that, and didn't speak Hungarian. But he was the fiercely Hungarian. Here's the canon. Here's the, here's the paradox, here's the irony. Okay, so what you see in, in the Hungarian is so by the way, Kosho in 1848 changes, realizes his mistake, and passes one of the most some of the most enlightened laws about ethnic minority rights, and you know, giving them the right to these ethnic groups to govern themselves in their own language and in schools or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, too late. Um, so, that's what I wanted to cover um, uh, in this lecture, uh, and again, the interest here is to, for you to understand um, the process of nation building and the conflicts it has generated, and the basis on which nation was defined, nationhood was defined around this time. And you see, it's not a un unilateral, unidimensional pro uh, process, you see the ethnocultural dimension, uh, how important it is, and you, should, you see how important it is for national identity, how, why culture is important for national identity, because national identity is built on culture, is defined around culture, uh, around the language, around the set of writings, around a certain moment when the language is defined through the writers, just like it was defined in any single language in the world, language has always been defined by writers, right, who produce it, and also when history is written. So, um, so to, to point out such, such things that are crucial for the region, but also not to forget that, especially in the case of Hungary, Poland, Czechs, the political uh, there was this other track as well of political defined nationhood. But clearly, this, the ethnoculturally defined nationhood, carried the day in most of these lands because, again and again and again, let's just look at the map of Central and Eastern Europe at the time, because none of them had to stay. If they would have had statehood, stable statehood, perhaps this dimension would have been weaker, just like it was throughout history. Okay, thank you.